Florida overnight. But first, some breaking news happening right now in another flooded neighborhood. People there need to be rescued. Western News has Chopper Dan McCarthy in the air. He's live in Altamont Springs with the details. And Dan, there's some heavy equipment involved. Yeah, there sure is. Right now, we got a picture of a family or a group of people trying to move a minivan that got flooded in the roadway. The road water depth in some areas is six feet plus. Um, Fire rescue is on scene. Sumlin County Fire Rescue is on scene. They got one of their old six ton fire rescue trucks that sits about eight feet above the water line. We saw that truck and fire rescue going door to door, banging on houses, searching the houses, making sure people get out of the houses, and then marking the houses, marking the mailboxes afterwards so others would know that the people have um, been vacated from that ho those houses. But right now, you can see the water level is four to six feet deep. Tom, pull out from that house there. There. And if you pan left, you can still see the rescue truck going to some of the houses trying to find people. We've seen people in kayaks, boats, wading through the water, going up door to door of these houses. This uh, street here is called Lake Spur Street in uh, Altamont Springs. We're on the west side of I-4, north of 436. And you can just see this entire area is just flooded. It's just so much water in this area. Uh, from all the flying we've done today, this is by far the worst. Guys, back to you. Dan, thank you. And our team coverage continues now with West Jews Dave McDaniel. He's live in that neighborhood in Altamont Springs. And Dave, this is methodical and intense. Well, it really is a remarkable scene that happened here in Altamont Springs. As Chopper Dan was telling you, this street here is right along the Little Wakaiva, and it does flood with some frequency, but everybody who lives along here say, never like this. Altamont Springs got the call around 2.45 this afternoon. The Seminole County fire started coming in. The water just kept coming up and coming up and coming up, and they started going in there to try to get some of these people out. Fire Rescue res rescued 45 people and 13 animals and they basically had other people who let themselves out. They say that about 75 to 100 homes are impacted here along the road. You can see how high that water is. They actually did use those six-wheeled military trucks, those high water trucks, to get in there and get some folks out. We talked with the woman who said she had no other choice. Her parents are on oxygen. So we saw the water coming up. Next thing I knew, my car was underwater, and we came back out again. Next thing I knew, everything is underwater. They said the river overflowed over there because there's no place else for the water to go. So it's all the way up to our house now. It's, it's a mess. But my parents are on oxygen and handicapped, so I had to get them out. So thank God for the fire department coming to get us because we had no other way to get out. So we've been here 39 years, and this is the first time this water's been this high. So it was a surprise to us. I mean, we almost didn't go, and they talked us into it. So well, I'm glad. I'm you glad. Did. I'm glad too. Now. What do you have to say to these folks? Thank you so much, all of you. Sheer jubilation right there. You're looking live right now at some folks out in a kayak. Uh, they're a little bit far for me to see, but I believe that it's a family, perhaps with the, the family pet, all everybody trying to get safely out. Now, according to Fire Rescue, there are some homes that don't have any water in them at all, some that have very little, some that have maybe a foot or more. But again, the roadway is impassable. That's exactly why they needed to have some people get out, some evacuated on their own, some needed a lot of extra assistance, and it was assistance they were glad to have. Reporting live in Seminole County, Dave McDaniel, West G News. Yeah, historic flooding in some neighborhoods. Dave, thanks. At the height of the storm, more than 6 million electric customers, more than 60% of the customers in Florida were without power. West Two Stuart Moore is here now to show us the latest numbers on the effort to turn the lights back on in Central Florida. Well, Jim, as you know, the numbers are going down, but there are still more than a million customers without power here in Central Florida. Take a look right now. There are actually nearly 1.3 million people, just short of that, without power in Central Florida. Now let's break it down county by county for you. We begin in Orange County where 305,000 people are still in the dark. Over in Seminole County, the number much less, but still significant, 154,000 people in the dark. In Brevard County, the number's at 216,000 people who don't have power tonight. In Volusia County, 185,000 people don't have power. Towards Lake County, the number's still the same, 102,000 people uh, do not have power going into the night. In Flagler County, 48,000 people don't have power. In Marion 
County, a little further to the north. 102,000 people remain in the dark tonight. Osceola County, the first county around Central Florida, one of the first counties uh, to get those strongest winds. 43,000 people don't have power. And Polk County, where Irma first made her wrath on Central Florida with the outer eye wall, 130,000 people don't have power this evening. Of course, crews are working around the clock to return power to as many people as possible and as quickly as possible, but it could take days, even weeks before everyone who lost their power gets it back. Meredith. Yes, your network to restore power to thousands of customers continues tonight. OUC tells West the power crews from across the country are at work to get some 121,000 customers back online. Michelle Meredith is live on Hanging Moss Road where an OUC crew just wrapped up. Well, you know, the crew had been working here for a while and they just took off, but OUC tells us they have a strategy when it comes to restoring power, which is to hit the lines that gets power to the most amount of people, then start working the tighter neighborhoods where four to five homes might be affected. Now, OUC tells us that Irma knocked out 60% of their customers and they have about 230,000 total. When will you get power? Well, we asked OUC's Tim Trudell. And we're looking at power being off for two days, three days, seven days. Is there any way to know? I, I would say it's definitely going to be more than two days. I mean, we don't know. Uh, I wish I could give you an exact answer. I wish I had an exact answer. I know we all do. Uh, but I, all I can tell you is we're doing everything we can to make this uh, as fast as possible. Obviously, we have to do this safely. The good news is the winds are subsiding. All of a sudden, it's sunny now. The conditions are much better. Uh, we're going to be working literally 24 hours a day. Our crews are staggered in 16-hour shifts, and they're from all over the country, and we're really happy to have them helping us out. Now, Tim says they will know a lot more tomorrow morning. Now, as a point of interest, in 2004, Hurricane Charlie knocked out the power to 80% of their customers. So Charlie was a lot worse. Live in Orange County, Michelle Meredith, West 2 News. After Hurricane Irma had made landfall a second time, the National Hurricane Center had projected its path to go basically towards the Tampa area. Uh, but we were all watching it, and at some point there was a wobble that took place. Yeah, after it made that uh, second landfall, after Marco Island went up towards uh, the Fort Myers area, Jim, and we, we thought we were seeing a wobble mm -hmm. uh, when it first started. But after about an hour and a half or two, let me show you what it looked like because it was uh, becoming more and more obvious that by the time we were at uh, uh, about uh, 10, 11 o'clock at night, that we had something that was going on that was uh, a different from the track from the hurricane center. This is an 18 hour loop here, and when you can see it coming ashore in Fort Myers, the actual center went right here right over Lake County and then kind of bend it back uh, to the north and the west. So right there at about 11 o'clock, we knew for sure that the core of the winds were going to be extending into the Four Corners area. And that's what we were most concerned with, with the potential there for 100 mile an hour gusts. So uh, we didn't quite get 100 miles an hour. We were in that 80 mile an hour range. But uh, Jim and Meredith, I'll tell you what, pretty scary uh, when we were out visiting Winter uh, Garden earlier today. Uh, more on the tropics coming up here in a couple minutes. All right, Tony, indeed, and at least two deaths are being blamed by Hurricane Irma. Today, we have learned a 51-year-old man died after being electrocuted by a downed power line. Well, she's Gail Pascal Brown is live in Winter Park with the details here. And Gail, just a sad story. It is in our hearts and our prayers go out to the family and friends of this man. As you mentioned, this is the second fatality due to Hurricane Irma. Winter Park police tell us that 51-year-old Brian Bowaldo was killed. Uh, he's from Orlando, and he was killed when he was on this street right here and was electrocuted by a downed power line. Neighbors coming out around 7 this morning in Orwin Manor in Winter Park to assess the damage left by Hurricane Irma found something they were not expecting. Um, we turned to the left in front of our house and we actually saw a body and we clarified that by getting a little bit closer and we saw that there was actually a live wire that was kind of attached to him and he was had passed so and we called 911 and Winter Park police say the body of 51 year old Brian Bewalda was found in the roadway at Leith and Westchester Avenues. Investigators say he was bringing a tarp to someone on the street whose house was leaking. He did have a tarp and underneath him. We did see that. Police say it was still dark when Bewalda was out and he walked right into the live power line. 
Now, the power line was fixed immediately, and neighbors here on the street, the same ones we talked to, took it upon themselves to put information on Facebook about, please, please, be careful when you come out here, because there were some down power lines at the time, and they just want you to be careful. Whether it's down power lines, down trees, it can be very dangerous, and in this case, deadly. I'm Gail Pascal Brown, live in Winter Park for West 2 News. Very sad situation, Gail. Thanks. Some students won't be hitting the books tomorrow. Many public schools were used as shelters, and counties need time to tidy up. Tomorrow, schools in Brevard, Flagler, Lake, Orange, Osceola, Seminole, Sumter, and Volusia do not have classes. Marion County also does not have school, but their classes are canceled until Thursday. Still ahead, our team coverage on Irma's aftermath continues tonight as we take you around Central Florida to see some of the damage. First in Volusia County, we'll take you to what is normally a very popular hot spot in Daytona Beach that tonight is in cleanup mode. And less than a year after Hurricane Matthew, it's here we go again for residents in Flagler County. You're watching WESH 2 News. The world's most famous beach took a beating in the storm. Irma pummeled the coast with strong winds and a driving rain. Those winds knocked over iconic sites in Daytona Beach. And Washington's Rob Lowe is there with a look at the rain that flooded many of the streets. Meredith, there were streets flooded, widespread damage and debris. And here along the beach, it is kind of bizarre to see a lot of people out here just one day after Hurricane Irma made its mark. Right now, the double red flag is flying, meaning the water is close to the public. There's also a high risk for rip currents, and the ocean is just not safe. As we pan back along the boardwalk, it appears the preparation by the store owners paid off. There is hardly any damage to businesses that were hit hard by Hurricane Matthew. Folks here say they're thankful the storm surge wasn't significant, considering how strong Irma was. They have a uh, condo over here on the beach. We saw a bunch of bunch of trees and uh, power lines down um, on actually just down here um, that we had to maneuver from, but uh, we're still a lot more to see. There definitely is a lot more to see and a lot more to clean up to be had as 200,000 here in Volusia County remain without power as crews work to turn on the lights tonight. They'll be forced to stay inside their homes beginning at 10 o'clock. That's when a mandatory curfew goes into effect. We're live in Daytona Beach. Robert Lowe, West 2 News. Irma caused damage up and down the central Florida coast. That includes Flagler County, which has only just recovered from Hurricane Matthew last year. Let's go to West Matt Matt Lapoli live in Flagler Beach with more Matt. Meredith and Jim, right behind us is the bridge over the Intracoastal Waterway on State Road 100, and Sheriff's Office officials are in the process of closing it down right now. Though tonight has nothing to do with winds. It's all about the curfew that's in place. With flooding and down lines and other damage, officials here don't want people out in the dark. They're asking them to sit tight. Uh, now take a look at some video. We've been out getting a look at the damage. We've seen the typical lots of shingles and, and fences are down around the county. Here on the beach side, you can see some more structural damage. Part of the roof of this home was ripped off by Irma. The homeowner tells us he's just glad his family, friends, and neighbors are saved after what was a very scary night. Yeah, we lost our roof last year in Matthew, and here again we lost it. So but overall, you know, we feel very blessed. You know, the, the road's in good shape. And that road is Highway A1A, and if it fared much better during Irma than it did Matthew last year, it's moving again today. Unfortunately, some people here in Flagler County, though, are dealing with roads that are flooded underwater. An entire neighborhood between Flagler Avenue and the Intracoastal Waterway is underwater right now. Now, back here live in front of the Bridge Estate Road 100, it will reopen tomorrow at 7 a.m., and that's when the curfew for all of Flagler County lifts. From Flagler County, Matt Lapole reporting West 2 News. Some neighborhoods are drying out finally today. Others, though, we're seeing the, the, the waters rise on up, and the governor earlier today talked about the potential for historic flooding in our state. Yeah, and we're going to see that, and we think uh, in, in some, along the rivers. We're, we're pretty close mm -hmm. to some major crests in a few locales. The Oklahoma River up there is going to be one we're going to have to watch. And then we're talking about Aster. You know, you got Lake Helen, you got uh, Lake Harney. It's pretty high there. Let, let me show you a wide perspective here across uh, the globe. Now, we've got Jose out there, but the bottom line is this. I think we're going to get 
a little bit of a breather here across the tropical Atlantic as we go through the next seven to 10 days. Sometimes you get this little a break after a, a very active peak, and I believe uh, that is what's going to be going on. The only thing we're going to have to watch, though, uh, is uh, to the south and east of the mid-Atlantic. Uh, there is Jose out there. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. But the latest on uh, Irma clearly showing it now lifting up into Georgia and weakening. Now a tropical storm. You can see that loop, how it went right along the Lake Sumter County line, but the heavy winds from the center extended uh, out towards uh, downtown Orlando, back towards Oviedo, Kissimmee, St. Cloud, Heathrow, Lake Mary, and it was a busy night last night, no doubt about that. It's also going to be very busy along the coast this week with Irma, Irma off to the north of us, and then there's Jose. Look at the wave action there. Some of that's going to be uh, emanating westward as we go through the next couple of days. So we're going to see higher than normal wave heights up and down the coast right through the upcoming weekend. Right now you saw that 9, 10 foot uh, wave action there. You take a look at the strongest wind gust. Uh, look at that. West of Holopah, 94 mile an hour peak wind gust there. Azalea Park, 84 mile an hour peak wind gust. Orlando International, just shy of 80 degrees. The other big story, we had the wind and boy did we have the rain. Look at West Holopah, 18.43 inches of rain. Oviedo, almost 14 inches of rain. Now all of that's adding up and the, the swells along our river, it's on, along the St. John's River, is really beginning to show up here. Look at Lake Harney, how it's going to rise here over the next couple days. You know, major flooding, moderate to major flooding is definitely going to be in the forecast here. We're going to have to watch that as we head towards the middle of the week and on into the upcoming weekend, especially if you live along the, uh, the river there. Just pay extra special attention to that. Now, as is always usually the case here, behind a tropical feature, you get some dry air. Look at that, 66 in Ocala, 70 in Orlando, 72 in Melbourne. Set up for tomorrow, we have southwesterly winds, a couple of isolated scattered showers, mainly to the north, no big deal. On Tuesday afternoon, look at these highs. You got the, the day off, maybe? You're looking to get out of cabin fever, so to speak. I can't say that I blame you. Upper 80s to near the 90-degree mark. Irma, Jose. A little tropical wave well off to the east that we're not too worried about right now. But we do need to spend a little bit of time on Jose. Looks like it's going to do a little bit of a loop-de-loop. -loop. The models today coming in this afternoon are just a little bit to the west of the center of the cone. So we definitely need to keep an eye on the trend of the models. Most likely staying east of Florida, but that's not yet uh, etched in stone. So I want you to keep checking back in. They're the latest computer models there. Most of them want to make the trek uh, our way and then out to sea. But there are one or two, especially the H Wharf, uh, that wants to get it very close uh, to the Bahamas here towards the weekend. So keep checking back in just to make sure right now we're uh, going to continue to watch it. Not too concerned yet, but definitely watching because of the trends today. 20 to 30 percent chance for afternoon showers and storms. Not too bad Tuesday and Wednesday. By Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Here we go. The typical pattern for us here in central Florida in the middle of September. Highs around 90. Rain chances at about 50 percent. It wasn't just people that felt Irma's wrath. Our crew stumbled upon some furry little friends who needed a hand today. Our West 2 reporter Greg Fox rescued a baby squirrel. Take a look. He found it stuck in the base of a toppled tree. Greg managed to put it into a napkin. The squirrel did not look injured and hopefully it finds its mother. Firefighters were at the right place at the right time for this next rescue. They saved a four legged Fred out of a really bad situation. They found the puppy inside a cage, nearly drowning, and her owner nowhere to be found. Her owner did eventually come back. He told us that the dog's name is Bougie. He said he left the house to check on family members when he saw Bougie on the news and then he rushed back home. Just this reminder do not leave your pets behind during a storm. Still ahead, before the storm, a lot of people did their best to get to higher ground. Tonight, we'll take a look at the mad dash to get back home and a traffic challenge for drivers returning after the storm. At Toyota of Orlando. Now that Irma has passed, people are back in traffic trying to get to their homes. This is what it looked like heading into Miami Beach after the bridges reopened. What a mess. You can expect these same scenes throughout the state for days to come. All that traffic headed back to Tampa and Miami will be having an impact here. Well, she's Dave McDaniel drove back from Tampa today and shows us the congestion along I-4. Driving from Tampa toward Orlando, you can see the stream of cars heading back toward the Tampa metropolitan area. People who had evacuated to the Orlando metro 
when it looked like Irma was going to make a direct hit on Tampa. Now, of course, they were actually enduring the worst part of the storm in the middle of the night in the Orlando area, but now are heading back to check on homes, property, and anyone they may have left behind in the Tampa area. Traffic moving extremely slowly. It's going to be one of those days where people are just going to be anxious and aggravated, but hopefully when they get home, things will be uh, working out for them as best as possible. Dave McDaniel, West 2 News. The long road to recovery continues for Central Florida, and we continue to see just how widespread the damage has been. Plus, we continue to follow breaking news. Dozens of people needing to be rescued from their homes after their neighborhood floods.